Rajat Gupta has had an extraordinary life. He was born in Kolkata, he was raised in Kolkata and then lost both his parents by the time he was 18 years old. Yet Rajat Gupta went on to graduate from IIT Delhi and then get a scholarship to study at the Harvard Business School. He went on at the age of 45 to become the youngest ever head of one of the world's leading consultancies, McKinsey. He was also their first India-born head. Imagine that, at the age of 45. It was a prestigious position that he held for nine long years. He was then a director at Goldman Sachs. It was a, an absolutely brilliant career. Many Indians looked up to him, admired him, and it was a meteoric rise that everyone was talking about. But then in 2012, there was also a fall from grace, a dramatic fall in his life and career. That was when Rajat Gupta was convicted of insider trading in one of the biggest insider trading scams in the United States, a charge that he consistently has denied to this day, but a jury did find him guilty and sent him to two years in prison. In 2016, Rajat Gupta came out of prison. It was a prison sentence that also included some time in solitary. And since then, he spent the last three years trying to rebuild his life, reconnect to the world, and has also taken out the time to write his side of the story in his memoirs. Rajit Gupta, thank you very much for joining us on NDTV. Thank you for having me. Well, as I said in my introduction, you had you know, such a brilliant run. And here you were the poster boy for so many Indians scaling these great heights in the corporate world. And then everything came crashing down for you when you were sentenced to prison. What was that like, that, that big rise and then that big fall? Well, really, uh, most of the damage was done when I was charged. Um, it was quite an extraordinary moment because um, first I had to, I chose to resign from everything. Uh, not only corporate boards, which I should have resigned, but also from all my philanthropic boards and so on, because I didn't want those institutions to be uh, questioned about why is he still on the board and so on and so forth. And uh, I write in the book about um, I normally has, had an incredibly busy calendar doing lots of different things. And the next day I woke up, my calendar was completely empty. There was absolutely nothing to do for the next foreseeable future. That was a dramatic, dramatic change. Um, of course, you know, I went through a long period uh, of preparing for the trial, things that happened to me along the way and so on. And those were all very tough times. Uh, but the initial shock was when I was charged and then I resigned from pretty much everything. What, what is it like to have your life turn around like that overnight? I mean, you know, like you said, your calendar was suddenly empty. How did you get through that, that change? Well, you know, you know it very well. The human spirit is extremely resilient. So, uh, you know, after the initial shock, you uh, kind of, you know, you have to gather your strength to say, I have to fight this. And not only do I have to fight it, I'm going to fight it to the best of my ability till the end and make sure I, I do that. And that's what I did. Um, it was tough. I, I, I have to say that, you know, uh, I kind of said now I have to reinvent myself, not only during those five years, which was or more than five years actually, um, which was involved the trial, then it involved appeals, a long legal process, then it involved going to prison, which is a, another quite extraordinary experience. Which I'll talk um, about. But you know, you, you may, I mean, as, as you mentioned, you've reached such a long legal battle also to clear your name and, and that's been going on for years. Um, and you haven't succeeded in that legally, but you maintain in your book, uh, that you were convicted on what was largely circumstantial evidence uh, that was brought forward by an overzealous prosecutor who essentially was determined to, I think, weave a conspiratorial narrative, as you put it. Explain that. I mean, and why, why was Preet Bharara so, trying to do that? Uh, let, let me set the context a little bit. We had this dramatic financial crisis, right? It is very clear now, if you look at it, as to who the primary people who were responsible for that financial crisis. It was a mortgage lending-led crisis. 
financial institutions, banks, housing finance companies were very involved in leveraging themselves, doing, making loans that they should have never made, so on and so forth, and practices that were not quite right. Not one of those people have been held accountable. Not a single bank CEO, senior management has been convicted. They've been fined heavily, which obviously the shareholders of the banks pay, but the real perpetrators of those that financial meltdown were never brought to justice, were never held accountable. So in that context, I think the prosecutors were looking for, we have to find something. Let's go after hedge fund managers or things like that, which they didn't contribute to the financial crisis at all in, in any, any way. So part of that was that, let's find this scapegoat. The other thing is in general, you know, in my particular case, they waited a long time because there was no evidence. It was only circumstantial. They had to create an atmosphere before they could bring the charges to me. And it was very simple. They, in, they charged me one week before Raj Ratnam's trial. And in fact, de facto, they were trying me at the court at his trial when I had no opportunity to defend. If you analyze the news stories during that time, half of them were about me. And you so got why, to, why make you the scapegoat of all people? Why, why you? I, I, you know, there is, there is a book that has come out. It's called Chicken Shit Club. And what that is about is that prosecutors are all about winning. You know, they're not necessarily searching for the truth. They're about winning. So, because they have political ambitions, they, they'll win at all costs. But then they'll also prosecute cases that they think they can win. So they created an atmosphere they could figure out that, you know, this was right after the financial crisis. People were mad, and they rightfully so, because the ordinary people lost a lot in the financial crisis. The banks got bailed out. The management of banks were amply well rewarded. Nobody paid any penalties, and they made huge amounts of money, no, nothing was carved back or anything. So it was the common person who was suffering. So, you know, they had to... You've also make... mentioned that the fact that, you know, you are an immigrant, you feel may have played a role in, in, uh, in, your, in the way that they went <clears throat> after you, but the person who went after you was Preet Bharara, as I mentioned, yeah. also, you know, someone of Indian origin. Uh, and he is also famous because he was involved in handcuffing an Indian diplomat a few years ago, which led to a, a crisis between India and the United States. Um, you know, just just elaborate on that. Uh, why you, you said that he was trying to burnish his tough guy aura. What, why, what, what's that, what was that about? about I, I don't know. You have to ask him what his motivations were. But uh, I, I can see that, you know, he would say, I'm tough against everybody and I'm tough against even my own, you know, people of my own origin. Uh, it could be. I don't know that that's, uh, that's true or not. Uh, I would say also he was very, um, he's known to be extremely media savvy. Lots of, you know, he increased, I write in the book, I don't know exactly how much, but he certainly increased the media presence and the media staff in his own organization. Uh, he tried, he was reprimanded by judges for trying the case in the media before actually trying it in the court. So I don't, I mean, this is not about Preet Bharara versus me or anything like that. I, I think generally there are some issues in the criminal justice system. I got to know the underbelly of the criminal justice system. I mean, the whole, this whole institution of plea bargaining is unbelievable because take Anil Kumar, he had a deal with the government. Now, he knew nothing about my case, zero. He should never have been a witness. But the, the government had control over him and made him a witness to establish things that were really not true. Like Rajatna was a great friend of mine. He was not a great friend of mine. He was a business partner. Well, you were doing business with him. Yeah, but he's not a great friend of mine. You know, I never, you know, he never came to my house. I have lots of people home. You know, I never, he never came to my house. I went to his house once for something. Did you call him that day? The day that the call records that they cite 
that that they cite as primary evidence against you that there was evidence that your phone there was a phone call from your phone to Raj Ratnam's phone. If you talk, if you see in the book, you'll see that that September call. Yeah. Uh, there were two calls that they cite. One is the September, one is the October call. The September call, I called him in the morning because he needed to, he had been avoiding giving me some information about this fund that we had together. And the Voyager. The, the Voyager fund. The, the prosecutors played up this, okay, the board meeting finished and within 16 seconds I called. Well, Every board member I know, every busy executive I know, gets out of board meetings and makes a call, okay? Even Lloyd on the stand admitted that every time he gets out of a board meeting, he calls. So I didn't call Raj Ratnam. I called my secretary and I asked her, did you get the information that Raj was supposed to give? And he said, no, I haven't got it. So I said, get me Raj. And I, to this day, this is four years later, I don't even remember whether I actually talked to him that day. The call was very, the, the duration was very short, whether my secretary was talking to his secretary and getting it set. I don't, I don't remember. But I do know that two hours later, I called his number again saying, I'm, I'm trying to catch up with you what's happening. That is recorded. No conversation is recorded between us. No. There was only one conversation that was recorded before. So it's a purely circumstantial evidence. But you have also said in, in the book that, that you made <clears throat> errors and you made misjudgments. What were those? For example, I'll tell you the, the only recorded conversation. You know, they, they recorded his conversations for 18 months or nine, I forget how long, long time. Hundreds and hundreds of calls. They have only one call that is of any, any substance between him and me. If I were a source for him, then I would be calling. I had attended, I was in six boards, four board meetings a year, 24 board meetings a year. If I was, had an arrangement with him, I would be calling much more often, okay? That would be recorded. But aside from that, mistake, you know, in that conversation I say, you know, this was a discussion at the board meeting which I never should have said. That's not a, you know, it was a figure of speech, it came out. There was no inside information in that conversation, zero. And whatever I said was already publicly in the public domain. But that was, you know, fundamentally a mistake. I uh, rejoined the Goldman board. I resigned from the Goldman board. The press announcements were made, etc. everything was done. Lehman went bankrupt. They came begging to me to say, please rejoin. Don't, don't resign. Don't resign. I should have resigned. I mean, I should have stuck to my decision saying, yeah, I resign. I should not come back. Um, nothing would have happened if I had resigned from the board, and none of this would have happened. So it's, uh, there are many, you know, the, also the judgment about, now there's a judgment in hindsight. At that time, Raj Ratnam was a very revered person in Wall Street. You know, I checked with Hank Paulson, who is a very dear friend of mine, and he said he's, he's a star. I, before I went into business with him, should, should I? And he was a very generous man. He had given to ISB. I had a very favorable opinion of him. I checked him out. He came out. Now everybody says he's, you know, X, Y, Z, but this is well, all in hindsight. Genius. Yeah, oh, but it's in hindsight, yeah. you know? Is at that time he was, you know, so yes, I maybe it was probably incorrect, but larger, larger issue is, you know, I spent my entire career in McKinsey. It's a very sheltered environment. The financial world is a lot more cutthroat than than consulting and and so on. So I perhaps didn't know, you know, the financial world that way, that way. You know, my only exposure was being on Goldman board, which is... How do you then go from being sort of the toast of the corporate world to prison? And you describe that in quite a lot of detail in, in your book. Uh, and you've talked about that time that you spent in solitary confinement, which right. was over a pillow, a pillow yeah. that you had got. I mean, so wow, what, was that, what was that about and how, how did you deal with that? So, you know, I think... The, the prison system, of course, um, has 
many issues with it. Um, they don't like people who can easily cope and are quite content there. You know, you, you, are, you aren't ever happy being in prison, but you can make the best of it. I mean, I had heard stories from my father about being in prison, etc. You know, he also always used to tell me, you know, you can't always control what happens to you, but you can control how you react to it, whether you react to it with grace, with forgiveness, with compassion, and so on. So when I went to prison, I went on a first a low security prison. Right. I was quite content. It was my destiny to be there. I had the advantage of a relatively shorter sentence. Two years is not long nor very short, but I saw the... Well, it could have the, been 25, right? Hmm? It could have been 25. It could have been not 25, but... That's the could, highest. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, it could have been long. So I was, yeah, I could see the end of the day in prison. I had over a hundred visitors registered in my, you, you have to apply for being able to visit. Every weekend I had my grandkids visit me. Every weekend, without fail, they came every Friday. Um, my family used to always visit me. Uh, I had many, many friends uh, from all over the world come and visit me. Uh, so I was quite happy and, you know, I did many things to try to help my fellow prisoners. I used to write letters for them. I would make sure their families were able to visit, people who didn't have any resources. So, so, th so I was quite engaged with the, the 128 prisoners that were there. Uh, I started a book club. I started a, you know... You uh, make it sound so pleasant. It's, no, no, it, it's prison. It is prison. But, yeah. it, but it, was, it was me. I walked 10, 10 miles a day. Um, I still have this, this is interesting, I, just because I carry it, I'll tell you. This is a little MP3 player, okay, that you could buy in the prison commissary. And um, then you could go and buy songs or download songs. And uh, I um, downloaded, it's an amazing library because you could download old Hindi songs and bhajans and all of that. And then my daughters would send me recommendations by download this song, etc. So there's, it has 300 songs. And I used to walk with this for three hours a day. Um, and I'd put it on shuffle and listen to music. So I was, I'm giving you this long story because I was quite, not happy, but content. You kind of dealt with your situation. I was dealt come with, to terms with situation, it. come to terms with this. I was enjoying it. I mean... In a funny way, I was enjoying it. It's, you know, I had time to myself. I used to play bridge, scrabble, you know, uh, walk outside in a beautiful environment. It was a walking path outside. It was very New England scenery and so on. But the prison guards didn't like that. They didn't like to see anybody. I was... Come to terms with it. Yeah. yeah with I, their I, was, uh, I was not rude to them. I was... Uh, you know, followed all rules and all that. But I was, you know, and they saw my relatives come in all the time, my friends come in all the time. I was happy. So they were, they were upset at that. I mean, I don't, you know, it's a strange thing. And so this guy finds a pillow. It's not even a pillow. It was a towel rolled into a circular thing. The towel you could buy at the commissary. I have a little bad back, so you, you get... You know, in prison, so he used that as an excuse? As a, he used that as an excuse to send me to solitary confinement. And then what happened was that he thought I would get all upset about it. And I didn't. I had my own little way of getting back to him because you can always schedule legal calls. So I asked my lawyers to schedule two calls a week for an hour or more. And he would have to come to the solitary confinement, the shoe cell. And, uh, um, he would have to handcuff me, chain me, all kinds of stuff, escort me to the conference room where I could take the call. And he would have to stand outside because of a legal call for the duration of the call. So the guy had to stand outside for one hour. So one day he asked me, he says, 
You know, everybody complains about, they ask, when am I going to get out of solitary and so on? You never say anything. I said, why should I? It's like prison with room service. All the meals get brought to me. I'm happily reading and doing whatever. So he said, oh, this guy's, you know, he's, he's not going to be cowed by solitary confinement. So then he took me out of there, this is after seven weeks, and put me in the high security prison. He said, this is not working. I, tro- I thought I'd break his spirit by putting him in solitary confinement. What's it been like for you to now rebuild your life in the last three years or so? Uh, what about old friends, old acquaintances? Have they all stood by you? Uh, those who didn't, what's it been yeah, like? Yeah, all is not the right word, but m- many, many have stood by me. My high school friends, my IIT friends, my HBS friends, you know, uh, many of uh, uh, the business executives I got to know here, board of ISB, board of PHFI, you know, uh, all lots of people um, have certainly stood by me. I have no, no, no issue with them. Some haven't, and that's okay. It's not. You know, in, in, in life, in the end, you only need a few friend, few good friends and, and a great supportive family. That's what you need. Can I ask you that when you look at the Indian <clears throat> economy today, would you advise your clients, if you were still working, to, to invest their money here in India? Sure. I mean, it's a, you know, it may be, some may find it a difficult place to do business. Sometimes... India, you say it's glass half full or glass half empty, but there is no going away from the fact that it is the largest, it will become the largest group of middle class in, in the world soon. It is a growing economy. It is, it's a market you cannot ignore. So you have to be here. Finally, Mr. Gupta, what are the lessons that you think corporate leaders can draw from your mistakes, your misjudgments, your rise, your fall? Is there any piece of advice you'd give them? No, I, I, here's what I, the reason I wrote this book, and it, it's, it's hopefully an interesting story, but it's hopefully something that everyone can relate to, pieces of it. And I didn't write the book by saying, okay, here's the chapter, here's the three lessons I learned. One, two, three. Next chapter, one, two, three. No. What I want people to dig is, if you read the book, you say, oh, I see, this is, this is the kind of thing I have faced myself. This is what he did. This was a mistake, he says that. Maybe, I want, I want them to see themselves in the story and internalize what lessons they get. People, different people will get different lessons. Okay. That's what I think. All right. Rajat Gupta, good to talk to you. Thank you very much. For Thank you very us. much. Thank, Thank you. you.